Well, I've made a few radical countercultural decisions in the past week or so. Um, about a week ago, our family went to the grocery store. And do you know what we did before we left? Any guesses? Prayed? That, that is a good guess. Unfortunately, we did not pray as a family. We did not eat before. No. We decided as a family that we would go to the grocery store without... No, oh, we had money. We had money. No, we had children. We had a list. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, we went to the grocery store without our phones. Raise your hand if you are someone who owns a smartphone and you can say you went to the store out to eat without your phone in the past month. Raise your hand. Wow, I am impressed. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, that is uh, quite a, a, an unusual occurrence uh, for us millennials. Uh, a couple days ago, I went to the grocery store by myself uh, just to pick up a few things. And again, I intentionally uh, left my phone behind. And as I was waiting in line, uh, I was waiting in line, waiting to get checked out. And I looked, and the lane right next to me, all of a sudden, there was nobody in that lane. You guys know what I chose to do? I chose to wait in the lane that I was going in. Before reading the ruthless elimination of hurry, I would have never done such a thing. I would have scoped out the, those aisles and I would have seen how many items were on uh, the conveyor belt. I would have seen which uh, cashier was going the fastest. I would have been in the fastest lane possible and I'd be right more often than not. But lo and behold, I was standing there with my groceries and a lady in front of me had a big cart and I just waited patiently. And what I didn't do is I didn't f turn and I didn't grab my phone from my pocket because I didn't have it. I can assure you, I can absolutely assure you, if I had my phone in that moment, I would have grabbed that sucker out and I would have been uh, strolling uh, through Detroit Free Press, reading about the Lions or Michigan State or on ESPN, consuming all of this information that my phone gives me. But instead, in this me trying to be uh, real thoughtful and, and uh, you know, walking the talk, I uh, didn't pull out my phone, and I had a moment, uh, a small moment, and I took that as an opportunity uh, to seek God uh, through prayer and through my thoughts. And, and these are decisions uh, that, unfortunately, are quite radical uh, for a millennial and the typical American in our society. These are all uh, decisions uh, that I've been motivated to take because of us going through uh, the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I can honestly tell you that these seemingly small decisions that I've made, uh, I have felt more peace and less of a hurry and closer to God. And these, these are very, very small baby steps, but these are small, small baby steps towards a huge victory a victory that is attainable for each and every one of us. And so last week, we started our new series on the ruthless elimination of hurry. It's based off of the book written by uh, John Mark Comer, a pastor out in Portland. In uh, the front row here, I have uh, seven extra copies. Um, after service, feel free, please take a copy of the book. If this is something that uh, directly applies to you in living an over busy hurried life. And the truth of the matter is that the majority of people in America, the majority of us sitting in this room, we live an over busy, hurried life. And so the majority of you guys, I would love for you to spend time consuming this material written by John Mark Comer, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. So please take a copy of it after uh, the service today. First come, uh, first serve. But uh, you are in the minority if you do not live an over busy, hurried life. Uh, last week, we uh, provided a self assessment to determine if we have what John Mark defines as hurried sickness. And there were 10 different symptoms of this hurried sickness. And I mentioned I scored a, a 7 or 8 out of 10. Yikes. Uh, that, that is pretty convicting that I personally I struggle with hurried sickness. 
And uh, after the service, uh, I talked to a handful of you guys and, and talked about this assessment with a handful of you guys. And everybody that I talked to regarding the survey was either on my level of seven or eight out of 10 symptoms or higher. Not a single person that I talked to after the service about the self-assessment said they scored lower than a seven. And so that was uh, more uh, confirming to me that yeah, that this is an epidemic in the country, but also this, this is something that we struggle with as a church as well. And we talked about last week how this is such a huge issue. It, it is a great enemy to our spiritual lives, as too many people are too busy to have an intimate relationship with God. We talked about how last week the, the church in America in general, we're more busy than we are bad. We're more distracted than we are non-spiritual, and we're more interested in movie theater, sports stadiums, the mall, you name it, than we are in the church. That's the unfortunate uh, situation that we find ourselves in the 21st century. And so this is an epidemic that we are facing, an epidemic that many don't even see the harm in it, unfortunately. And maybe for a handful of us, myself included, we, we didn't see all of the ill effects uh, of living a hurried, uh, over busy life. But hopefully last week, you, you guys were, were uh, made aware of how prevalent the, this concept of being over busy and hurried is in our society and probably in your life as well. But not only did, did you see how prevalent it is, but hopefully you see how dangerous it is living an over busy, hurried lifestyle. It is, as Dallas Willard said, it is the great enemy of our spiritual lives. And so that's all we did the first week, it just brought awareness to that uh, uh, of how prevalent it is and, and how big of an issue it is. Throughout the rest of this series, we're, we're going to be trying to remedy this issue. We're, we're going to be taking a look at some practical application in our lives to help remedy us and not living an over hurried lifestyle. So our task of finding a solution to this issue starts now. So the biggest limitation that we face as humans is time. No matter what your life looks like, I know without a doubt, you have 24 hours in your day. That's the same amount as me, that's the same amount as the people sitting around you, that's the same amount as every other person alive. We all have 24 hours in our day. We cannot get more time in our day. That, that's how God structured the cosmos, See the, the the, the earth and its relationship to the sun. We have 24 hours because of uh, the, the stars and the sun. And so often I find myself wishing that I could just have one more hour in my day. Has anybody wished that, man, I wish I could just have one more hour in my day. And if I just had one more hour in my day, all of my problems would be solved. But even if God completely restructured the cosmos so that we did have one more hour in our day, I don't think that would solve our issue of being over busy. I do not think the solution is more time. If we had more time, we would just use that on all the other things that we don't currently spend our time on whether that be learning the guitar or uh, watching one extra episode on Netflix or Disney Plus or uh, spending one more hour with our kids or our spouse or reading an extra chapter of a book, I know you would find a way to fill that time. As the possibilities for us to spend our time today are essentially limitless. It is incredible all of the opportunities that we have readily available at our fingertips. And with the typical uh, American overstuffing their 24-hour schedule, the evidence suggests that we would just overstuff our extra hour in the day. So let me tell you, the solution to our issue of being over busy and hurried in our life, the solution is not more time. Because all we do with that more time is we would just add more and more and more stuff in our life. Because that's what we do with our other 24 hours in our day. And so we have to understand that we simply cannot do it all. We simply do not have enough time in our day um, to, to do it all, not even close. 
You know, uh, with that being said, not being able to do it all, um, as there's so many opportunities out there in this world, we have all got to learn how to say no. That, that has got to be part of our vocabulary as human beings. My precious son, Ezra, uh, who is picking up on this whole talking thing, a little on the slow side, is a hundred times better at saying no than most of us are. He tells us no all of the stinking time. He gets it. That is his favorite word. And so today I'm going to call up a, a guest speaker here, and hopefully he can, if he cooperates, he can help demonstrate you all how to say no, because a lot of us, we, we, do, we do not understand how to say no. Hi, buddy. How are you? Say hi. You don't want to say hi? Say no. No. You want that? No. This, this, this works every time. Yes. Yes. I was afraid of this. A little shell shock. He's saying no. I was afraid of this. Fail demonstration. No. You want to go back? You want to go back or no? No. Yes. Yes. No. Fail demonstration. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> no. Do you want to leave? No. <laughs> No, there you guys heard it. Thank you. You guys heard it. No, no, he does not want to go back. And we have got to learn how to say no in our lives because without even being aware of it, every yes that we say is a thousand no's. When you say yes to watching a show, uh, uh, an episode of a television show, you are saying no to all of the other TV shows, and you're saying no to all of the other movies. You're saying no to spending time with your family. You're saying no to reading a book. You're saying no to going out for a walk, going out to eat. You name it. Everything that you say yes to, you are subconsciously, simultaneously saying no to all of these other options that we have available to us. And so we have to realize the implications of saying yes to something. And a lot of us, myself included, we are way, way too willy-nilly about this. We will agree to do just about anything because saying yes is a lot easier. It makes people a lot happier when we say yes. But sometimes we just have to say no. Some of you all here say it. Let me hear you say it. No. Yes. Louder. No. Yes. Angry. No. Yeah. There we go. We have to say no. As most of us, we waste copious amounts of time with the things that we say yes to do. Most of the hurry and the overload and the busyness that we experience, it is self-inflicted. And we have to stop doing this to ourselves. Too many of us are interested in, in, in pleasing others first. Too many of us are seeking first the kingdom of entertainment when we should be seeking first the kingdom of God. And so that time that God has blessed you with, it is a gift. And we have to use it to the best of our ability. The apostle Paul said in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16, look carefully then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So we have got to make the best use of our time. And so sometimes that's going to require you to say no to an opportunity that has come your way. Uh, a book a number of years uh, that I read ago, uh, one line that, that really has struck uh, with me from uh, this book um, is that the greatest distraction to our purpose in life is good opportunities, is other good things. The, that, that is the greatest distraction in our life. That is the greatest deterrence 
from us seeking God first and foremost. It's not bad things in our life. It's these other good opportunities that come our way. The issue is we overpile our lives with these good opportunities. And before we know it, we don't have enough time to establish an intimate relationship with God. As every single relationship takes time. Your relationship with your spouse, it takes time. Relationship with your kids, it takes time. With your friends. And the same applies with God. It takes time to establish, maintain, and build your relationship with your heavenly father. But too many of us are too willy-nilly about saying yes to everything that before we know it, we're saying no to God time and time and time and time again. And so if adding more time into our day is not the solution, then what exactly is the solution to uh, this epidemic of living a hurried and overbusied life? And the answer is really very simple. The answer is adopting the lifestyle of Jesus. If you are someone who struggles with living a hurried and overbusied life, then all you have to do is adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. If we would do this, if we would adopt the lifestyle of Jesus, then we would solve this issue along with so many others. So it's a, it's a very simple concept. It's very, very difficult to apply in our lives. But when, when we read through uh, the Gospels and we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, Jesus was rarely in a hurry. We're going to take a, a prime example of this uh, real briefly in the book of John, John chapter 11. If you if you have your Bibles, you can open up to John chapter 11. And in John uh, chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it reads, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So you got to remember uh, from that story of Mary and Martha, another example of being over busy, hurry. Martha, when she was needing to get everything ready for the Lord, Mary was more laid back and, and just lived in the moment uh, and, and appreciating having that interaction with the Lord. Well, well, these same two ladies, they had a brother, Lazarus, uh, who was a friend of Jesus. And, and apparently, Lazarus was sick enough that these sisters sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And if we jump down to verse 5, it reads, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. So when Jesus found out that, that his dear friend Lazarus, whom he loved, was ill, clearly not doing well at all to the point where his sisters sent him or, or his sisters sent word to Jesus himself, which was not an easy uh, process in, in the, the life of Jesus. They didn't have their smartphones. They could just pull out their phone and text, find Jesus on their contacts, say, hey, Jesus, uh, Lazarus is not feeling well. Instead, they made a deliberate effort to go and seek Jesus out. So that clues me in. That, hey, Lazarus, he's pretty sick. And, and this information would have been common knowledge that he was pretty sick. We're not talking about uh, just a common cold. And so what did Jesus do? What was his reaction? Well, he quickly packed up his bags and he left in a hurry. No, that's not what he did. I'm kind of astounded by what Jesus did here. It says in verse 6, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So in learning that his dear friend Lazarus was sick and knowing that Jesus had the power to heal Lazarus of his sickness, Jesus stayed two days longer. Jesus was not in a hurry. You know, the story is somewhat, uh, it's very emotional. If we, continue, if we were to continue throughout uh, the, the story here, uh, the, the two sisters, Mary and Martha, they both approach Jesus on separate occasions. And this is after a Lazarus, he died from this illness. He died because Jesus did not get there in time. 
And so these two grieving sisters, both of them on separate occasions, they approach Jesus and they say, quote, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had hurried and packed up your things quickly, Lazarus, whom you loved, would not have died. This is a very touching story. This is the shortest uh, verse in all the scriptures. Chapter 11, verse 35, it says, Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Jesus grieved over the death of his friend, Lazarus. Now, if we were to close this story out, lo and behold, Jesus, uh, through the power that God vested in him, he, he victoriously uh, rose Lazarus from the grave. And so uh, there, there's an alternative uh, lesson to be learned there. But, but I'm astounded in the fact that when Jesus heard that his dear friend Lazarus was sick, he did not hurry up and pack his things. Now, I will say there, there's a time for us to hurry in our day and age. If your child is choking, then that is a good time to drop whatever you're doing and hurry and go and help them. So there is a time for hurry. It's a 9-11 emergency. That is a time to hurry. But when in doubt throughout Jesus' ministry, he was not in a hurry. Even when his dear friend Lazarus was sick and Jesus had the power to heal him from his sickness. Another brilliant example of Jesus demonstrating that he was hardly in a hurry uh, quoted uh, from the book, uh, John Mark wrote, after all, this is the man who waited three decades to preach his first sermon. And after one day on the job as the Messiah, he went off to the wilderness for 40 days to pray. Nothing could hurry this man. <laughs> I read that at my campsite and I literally laughed out loud when I read this to myself at my campsite, probably because uh, you know, things were funny to me because I was by myself. But nothing could hurry this man. I mean, I just imagine this. Jesus, he, uh, a lot of people believe he spent about uh, the first uh, 30 years in his life getting prepared for his ministry. He spent time praying and reading and, and getting to know his heavenly father. And then finally, after 30 years of Jesus preparing to be the Messiah, preparing to be the Savior, he, he gets baptized uh, by his relatives. John the Baptist, and Luke talks about how, how Jesus was preaching to these people. And then immediately, Jesus went off to the wilderness to pray for 40 days. That blew my, that, I mean, that, that blows my mind. I mean, I kind of put myself in Jesus' shoes, and you guys waited on me uh, for a bit. We agreed that, that I would be the pastor at North Hills before I was ready to come. And there was a, a period of waiting, and, then, and there's a bit of anticipation in coming with the waiting. And I could just imagine if I showed up here on my first Sunday of church and said, all right, y'all, have a good one. I'm out of here for 40 days. I'm going to go spend time in the wilderness and spend time with God. That would not be received very well. I'm very confident of that. Uh, be, but maybe we need to realign our priorities. Maybe we need to realign how we think. Because apparently this was very appropriate for Jesus. First day on the job, he left and he spent 40 days all by himself. And so nothing could hurry this man. Bless, bless him, bless Jesus. And so we need to mimic this lifestyle of Jesus. We have to arrange or rearrange our schedules to line up with the lifestyle of Jesus. And for many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, that's going to involve radical change. We're not talking about j just changing a couple of things. Some of us, we, we need radical change in our lives to reflect the lifestyle of Jesus and, and ruthlessly eliminating this issue of hurry. We have to adopt his lifestyle. Too many people, they want the life of Jesus. They want to be his follower, but they do not want the lifestyle of being his follower. Me personally, uh, I like uh, watching YouTube videos. Probably my favorite type of uh, video to watch on YouTube is entrepreneur videos. I love, uh, I know it's kind of uh, geeky, nerdy, but I love watching the life of an entrepreneur. And in many of these uh, videos I enjoy watching, these entrepreneurs, they just go throughout their day and they narrate what they do Monday through Friday, or sometimes uh, Sunday through Saturday. And they just talk about their day. And, and I find that uh, very alluring for whatever reason. Uh, but many of these guys, uh, they talk about how they wake up in the wee hours of the morning and they get lots of done before 
before the typical person is awake. And I know some people are like that here in this room now, and I love that. I want that in my life. I want that life to be an early riser and to get a lot done before most of society is even awake. And so I try to do this on a number of times in my life to varying degrees of success. As I, and, I, and when I do try this, I truly do love early mornings. I absolutely love it. I love waking up, spending time with God before the rest of society is awake, getting work done before the rest of society is awake. I truly love that in my life. I love the early mornings and getting a kickstart to my day. However, I do not like the lifestyle. I do not like the lifestyle of an early bird. I do not like the choices that this entails. Because do you know what you have to do if you want to wake up really early in the morning? Anybody know? You have to go to bed really early. And I did not like that. I love my early mornings, but even more than my mornings, I love my late nights. I sometimes am very productive late at nights. It's my time to de-stress uh, from kids. Uh, it, it, it's, it's my personal time, and I love my time late at night. At the same time, I love the idea, I love the life of an early riser, but I couldn't have both. I need to choose one or the other. And so I love this life of an early riser, but I was not willing to, to live out the lifestyle. And so that's not the life for me. I'm a night owl. Any other night owls out there? Yeah, there we go. I can uh, relate with you all. Has it, have any of you night owls tried to wake up early in the mornings, but you just can't let go of the night? Yeah, I see a couple of hands out there. That lifestyle is not for us. The issue is, that's how many people feel about Jesus. They look at the life of Jesus. They look at what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, and they say, I want that. I want that in my life. But then when it comes to the lifestyle of being a follower of Jesus, it's a hard pass for a lot of people. And you cannot have both. You cannot have the life of a follower of Jesus and not exhibit the lifestyle of Jesus. You cannot have it both ways. The church in America in general would love to have it both ways. They would absolutely love to have it, the best of both worlds. Well, it's not even the best of both worlds, but you, but you, you cannot have it both ways. You must truly want to live like a follower of Jesus and follow his lifestyle, or it's not for you at all. And I want to stay away from that as a church. And so when we look at the life of Jesus, in the midst of the busyness that he faced, he constantly made time for his relationship with God. Constantly. He often withdrew to desolate places to pray. We're, we're going to be talking about that in next week. And so we have to emulate that lifestyle of Jesus in our life as well. And if the results you are getting are lousy and being a follower of Jesus, you have anxiety, depression, high levels of stress, emotional burnout, little to no sense of the presence of God, then the odds are very good that something about your lifestyle is off kilter. The odds are very good that your lifestyle is not in line with the lifestyle of Jesus. The way you organize your morning or evening routines, your schedule, your budget, your relationship to your phone, how you manage your valuable resources of time, money, and attention. And so if you do not feel a close presence to God, the odds are good that your lifestyle is not in line with the lifestyle of Jesus. And so we all have an all-important life-saving decision we must all make. We all have more than enough time to follow Jesus. 24 hours in a day is a sufficient amount of time for this. God has provided the resources for us to do that. But we must choose. Do you really want to follow Jesus or not? And really honestly ask yourself that. Do you really want to follow Jesus or not? 
Because saying yes to Jesus means simultaneously saying no to thousands of other choices. Because following Jesus means adopting his lifestyle. And is that something that we are willing to do? My guess is that everybody here, we want to follow Jesus. I'm guessing that's why you decided to come here this morning at church, because you want to follow Jesus. So the desire probably isn't the issue. It's how we structure our life. It's the systems, it's the habits that we have placed in our lives. Our lifestyle does not mimic the lifestyle of Jesus. And so if this is something that you want in your life, in these next four weeks, we're going to be talking about four practices of Jesus that he exhibited in his lifestyle that we must emulate as well. Now, we aren't going to be uh, spending four weeks talking about practices that would be nice to have in our life. No, we're going to be talking, we're going to be spending four weeks about four practices that we must have in our life if we want to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And if we do this, then we as a church, we can be a church that can ruthlessly eliminate hurry in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Father, we give you all of the glory and the honor and the praise. Father, I thank you for the 24 hours of a day that you bless each and every one of us with. Father, I pray that we all make the best use of that time. Father, I pray that as we read through the Gospels, we read about the life and ministry of your son. Father, I pray that we learn to mimic his attitude, mimic his schedule, mimic his lifestyle so that we can be a follower of your son and a follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious and holy name that we pray, amen.